You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War. On this episode of our Spanish Civil War interview series, I was joined by Dr. Ed Packer from the Basque Children Association. We discussed the story of the 4,000 children that were brought to Britain in 1937. These children came to Britain at a time when their homes and their families were in serious danger, and their story is a mixture of fascinating and also a little heartbreaking. If you want to learn more about these children, you can go to baskchildren.org, which I've included a link to in the show notes and on the podcast website. It's a really cool site with a lot of really fascinating information about the experiences of these children, both during the Spanish Civil War, their time in Britain, and then also afterwards. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spanish Civil War interview series. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ed Pecker, a trustee for the Basque Children Association. The association was started in 2002 with the goals of remembrance and education about the 4,000 children who came to Britain from Spain in 1937. Dr. Packard, how's it going today? Uh, it's going quite well, uh, as well as could be expected uh, in 2020. Um, <laughs> as a as a, as a historian based in Britain, uh, we're, we're facing up to a, another lockdown uh, from Thursday. Um, but other than that, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good that at least the sun's shining today. <laughs> Excellent. Good to hear. OK, so here we are here today to talk about the Basque children. Now, these were Spanish children evacuated from Spain, and it seems like many of them were very young. Uh, what were the age ranges of the children that we're talking about today? Um, well, Essentially, um, it's children between the age of five and 15, uh, 4,000 boys and girls between the age of five and 15. Um, now, the campaign to bring the Basque children to Britain began uh, in the aftermath of the Guernica bombing on the 26th of April 1937. Uh, and a couple of days after that, owing to public pressure, the government um, agreed to allow some children in. Um, by the 15th of May, that had become a firm commitment to allow 2,000 children in between six, age between six and 12. Um, and then a couple of days later, partly because one of the organizations that was pressing for the children to be allowed in was really concerned. Um, it was it's quite a racist concern in some ways. They were concerned about what would happen to older girls if um, the city of Bilbao um, fell to the rebels, um, General Franco's rebel troops, um, who were predominantly from Morocco. And they worried what would happen to the older girls. Uh, if, if that was the case. And so um, on the 17th and 18th of May, uh, the government um, said they'd allow 4,000 children in. So they doubled the amount and they would be aged between five and 15. Um, so they went from six to tw six, between six and 12 to five and 15, although most of them were somewhere in the, in the middle. There were very few at the, the, the two extremes. Um, now, it's worth also pointing out that the ship that brought the children to Britain sailed on the 21st of May from the port of Santurce near Bilbao. Um, and so this was this was quite a, a, a rapidly changing set of circumstances. So Guernica is the 26th of April. The children arrive in Britain uh, less than a month later. And the, the people organising uh, both in Bilbao and in Southampton, where they arrived, um, they initially thought they were going to get 2,000, and then less than a week before they arrive, it's going to be 4,000. I bet there was a bit of scrambling to, to make that work. Uh, there, there was. Where the children first uh, were taken to was a place called North Stoneham, which is just outside Southampton. And a farmer had uh, offered his field, uh, you know, a large field for the children to stay in. And it was essentially a campsite. Uh, there were 500 
uh, tents for 4,000 children. Um, and and uh, to, to be honest, uh, you know, conditions got pretty unsanitary there quite quickly. Um, it, it was only meant to be a temporary uh, accommodation. I suppose as well, while we're thinking of numbers, 4,000 sounds like a lot of children. And if you, if you look up photos of the children arriving, um, they arrived on a, an old liner called the SS Havana, which was not designed for 4,000 people. And if you, if you see video footage or um, still photographs of, the, of this ship arriving uh, in, into uh, Southampton, you, it looks absolutely crammed. And it, you know, it does look like an enormous amount of children. Um, the main historian of the Basque children, um, uh, a man called Adrian Bell, he's written that this was the, uh, the largest single influx of refugees into, into Britain. Um, and, they were, and they were pretty much all children. They were accompanied by some adults. Um, they weren't accompanied by their parents. That wasn't allowed. Uh, much like the, the kinder transport um, uh, the, fo the following year, which began the following year. Uh, but it's worth putting this into some kind of context because in the Spanish Civil War, uh, there were over half a million people who left Spain, um, in many cases permanently to, to various countries in Europe. And just uh, amongst the Basque children in 1937, um, uh, there's, there's around 20,000 children who leave and most go to France. France takes the vast majority. Um, uh, 4,000 come to Britain, others go to Belgium, Denmark, Mexico, the Soviet Union and Switzerland. Um, so I think it's worth putting that into context too. Excellent. So, so these children, they come to, to Britain and, and the government allowed them. Obviously, they had to have government permission to get into the country. But my mm -hmm. understanding is that this was not a government funded program or, or a government funded project. Uh, so how how was support raised to kind of fund these children coming and supporting them? And, and how was the effort coordinated? Well, I think there's, there's um, a few sides to that. I think it's first of all worth concentrating a little bit on why uh, the government's attitude, uh, why the government uh, weren't uh, sponsoring this program. And in fact, the government were quite hostile uh, to, to the idea. Um, and that needs to be put into context um, as to Britain's policy towards the, the Spanish Civil War, which, um, as I'm sure you've discussed uh, on other podcasts, it was, was, a, uh, uh, was, a, was in line with appeasement. It was a policy of non-intervention. The idea uh, for the British uh, government was um, if the other powers of Europe didn't supply the Spanish Civil War or didn't choose a side in the Spanish Civil War, the, the conflict would die out um, uh, through, lack of, uh, through lack of supplies and such like. And then Britain didn't want the, the, the situation in Spain to escalate to a, to a general war. Uh, but, but when the um, Spanish Civil War broke out uh, in July 36, um, the Basque country um, was loyal to the Republic. If you look at a map of the Spanish Civil War when the, um, uh, when, when the Civil War breaks out, um, the vast majority of uh, Republican territories in the south and the east, but there's a strip of uh, territory in the north, which is uh, kind of separated by, by the, uh, the rebel territory. Um, which includes the Basque, uh, which includes a large amount of the Basque country, um, including the industrial centre of Bilbao, uh, quite important for a, for a war effort. Um, the Basque country's loyalty is interesting because um, the the, uh, the Basque Nationalist Party, which um, was quite important in the Basque country, remained loyal to the Republic, even though it was quite a socially conservative um, group. Because ultimately, Franco uh, didn't want to allow any kind of uh, regional autonomy. Um, to to um, to any part of Spain, so the Basques, uh, with their history, weren't going to uh, get behind that. Um, so in in March 1937, Franco um, Franco's forces invade uh, the north, and they do this with the two classic kind of uh, weapons of total war: a blockade by the navy to try and starve um, the population, um, and bombing uh, by German and Italian aircraft, um, uh, most famously Guernica. Uh, so Guernica, um, the bombing of this market town, which um, was reported on in the Times, uh, the journalist George Steer wrote a, a famous article uh, outlining what had happened in Guernica, and, and obviously to British public opinion, um, knowing what was going to come in the next war, uh, you know, already kind of knowing that, that, that the next war would, uh, uh, would involve kind of bombing of cities, this, this, this caused uh, widespread outrage. Um, and also these bombings and the blockade exacerbate an internal refugee crisis. So Bilbao is getting full of people, full of hungry people who are also um, being, being bombed. Bilbao is bombed regularly as well. Um, and so this is where the kind of um, the effort to kind of bring the Basque children to Britain begins. Um, a, a lady called Leah Manning, who was a former MP for the Labour Party, um, arrived in Bilbao just before Guernica. And uh, she was trying to arrange an evacuation of children. Um, through her 
her then role as a representative of the National Joint Committee for Spanish Relief, which was a non-governmental organization which had sprung up in the, um, uh, towards the end of 1936, because in response to the Spanish Civil War, lots of British people, lots of groups in Britain wanted to do something to help the Republic, or the other, or the other side, or the rebels uh, to, a, to a lesser extent. Um, a lot of groups had sprung up to try and offer aid to particularly uh, civilians who were suffering as a result. And a lot of these were kind of grassroots and disorganized. So the National Joint Committee um, was, a, was a kind of umbrella for a lot of these groups. And so um, Leah Manning's in, in Bilbao. She starts sending, particularly after Guernica, these urgent telegrams back to, to London. Um, the British consul in Bilbao, Michael Ralph Stevenson, is also advocating for an evacuation of children as well. Um, and the National Joint Committee is campaigning in Britain. And this is what, this is what forces, the, uh, forces the British government to kind of accept, um, in principle, the admission of some children. Um, and so the government accepts the children, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't, approve, uh, it doesn't approve of them. A number of figures in the government, a number of figures in the, the civil service, including the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, express misgivings. Um, Franco and his supporters in Spain and Britain also uh, were highly opposed. Um, and the government was concerned to maintain the non-intervention pact. Um, the British ambassador to Spain, a man called uh, Sir Henry Chilton, he argued that if you took children away from Bilbao and, took them, uh, and let them go into Britain, you would be, you would be undermining non-intervention because you'd be removing what he called useless mouths. In other words, the, the, the uh, Republican uh, side had to feed these children um, if you took them out of the war zone, you could feed your soldiers instead, and it would be, uh, and that would not be in keeping with non-intervention. So, kind of horrific kind of it's, view, it's really. It's not very really pleasant that, at all. No, but um, but um, the, the the government had to relent um, because of the, the public outcry. It's a very rare example of where kind of public opinion uh, forces uh, forces a change a change of policy. Um, but the government, um, as you say, they don't sponsor this program. They allow the children in but they, they have very strict instructions. Um, so to kind of maintain the facade of um, non-intervention, they say the children should be selected from all creeds and classes without distinction of political attachment. So in, in theory, the idea was that you should take a certain number of children um, from each of the main kind of political uh, groups uh, in the Basque country, uh, if their, parent, you know, their parents identified as such. Uh, in practice, it was quite easy to get around that. Um, and it was particularly kind of... Um, uh, socialist parents who were eager to get their children out of um out of uh um out of the Basque country at that point um the other the other condition was that these children should be repatriated as soon as conditions permitted and that became controversial later on um and the other the other um uh, the other condition was that the national joint committee uh would have complete responsibility financially and otherwise for the children in other words um uh, the National Joint Committee for Spanish Relief would uh, would not just be responsible for raising money to look after the children, but would be responsible for organising um, the accommodation, education, and everything else that comes with looking after 4,000 children aged between 5 and 15. Um, the government specified that by allowing these children in, the National Joint Committee was committing to raising 10 shillings per child per week. Um, and 10 shillings uh, in 1937 would have been roughly... Twenty-five pounds today, or around thirty dollars uh, today. Although I'm aware uh, by the time the podcast goes out, the pound-dollar <laughs> exchange rate might be um, might be uh, in turmoil. But who knows? Um, in any case, um, the effort was coordinated not by the National Joint Committee because once it became clear the children were coming, official representatives of the labour movement in Britain and the Catholic Church in Britain w said, "We want to get involved. We want to help look after these children." Um, but they refused to cooperate directly with the National Joint Committee because the National Joint Committee was willing to work with communists. Um, so kind of the, the wider politics of this wider European um, civil war come into play um, at this point as well. So on the 15th of May, um, and again, think about how quickly this is all happening. The 15th of May, the children arrive in just over a week. Uh, 15th of May 1937, a Basque Children's Committee is formed, um, which enables the participation of... Um, uh, the, the church, uh, the Catholic Church, and the, the Trades Union Congress. Um, the NJC, the National Joint Committee, do wield a strong influence over the new committee. Its, its members are in important positions within the Basque Children's Committee. But nonetheless, the, the, the Basque Children's Committee is designed to be this very broad, overarching um, humanitarian organisation, trying to avoid political divisions. Um, but 
by the time the, the Basque Builders Committee had been formed, there was already uh, a national fundraising campaign underway. This began in earnest at the start of May 1937, so a week or so after Guernica, a few days after the government have um, said we'll, we'll allow some children in, um, the, a, a letter appears in the Times newspaper. Um, it's an avowedly non-partisan, it's a humanitarian letter which is asking um, for donations. Um, and people from a range of political backgrounds sign this, sign this letter, including um, Catherine Stewart Murray, uh, the Duchess of Athol, who was a Conservative MP who chaired both the National Joint Committee and the Basque Children's Committee. Um, so there, there are, you know, at first there's this very wide ranging, cutting across political and religious divisions, um, a, a very uh, kind of humanitarian appeal, which was reinforced by media reports, um, both before and after uh, the Havana arrives at Southampton carrying the children. The campaign to support the children very much avoids discussing any rights or wrongs about the Civil War. It portrays the children as um, uh, stricken waifs. The idea is that these children are innocent, apolitical victims of a modern conflict. Um, and of course, uh, children were a major source of humanitarian concern in Britain throughout the Spanish Civil War. Um, the Duchess of Athol and Eleanor Rathbone, um, an independent MP, had visited Madrid um, in April 1937 and been horrified by the plight of children there. Um, and uh, people might be familiar with the If You, if you Tolerate This poster, which uh, shows a child victim of, um, uh, of, um, of, of the, battle of, uh, the battle for Madrid. So you know you know children and humanitarianism kind of go hand in hand with the with the spanish civil war and britain british reactions reactions to it um and uh the campaign meets with enormous amounts of success uh, by the end of may 1937 uh the basque children's committee's secretary a man called wilfred roberts who was a liberal mp and another leading light in the national joint committee he estimated that they'd raised about twenty two thousand pounds um enormous sum of money um and uh it wasn't just money that was coming coming in um, as well. There were lots of offers uh, for accommodation and other things that children need, clothing, uh, toys, things like that. Um, the Catholic Church and the Salvation Army um, respectively agreed to house 1,200 and 400 children without charge. And, and the Basque Children's Committee received 252 offers of free accommodation um, for the remainder in what were called approved local centres. Um, We'll, we'll talk about where the children are sent to um, later on, I'm sure. But um, just to say that they don't end up going to 252 different places, but it's just a kind of, sort of sign of a scale that they, they receive these, these offers uh, for accommodation. Um, much of this organisation and fundraising was cent centrally coordinated at first by the Basque Children's Committee, but over the weeks and months, um, lots of local groups sprang up who would take responsibility for fundraising and caring for groups of the children. Um, and although we'll, we'll presumably go over the story of the children's stay in Britain, um, as the children's stay in Britain did turn from months to years, um, there was an element of charity fatigue. Um, people in Britain started to get more concerned by other things as well as 37 th turned to 38 to 39. There, there are some... events that happen. That, that yeah, there are, there, are, yeah there, there, there are other things. And um, I think both the, the parents of the children who were sent over to Britain and people who were um, offering to help look after them didn't anticipate they would be here for very long. Um, the kind of um, the, the main trope that surrounds this is the idea that a lot of the children remember being told they were only going away for three months, um, only for three months, which is the title of Adrian Bell's history of the, uh, uh, the Basque children, which is well worth reading. But, um, but most of them were still here after three months. The vast majority were still here. Um, and uh, over half were still in Britain uh, a year later. Um, so, it, it, And of course, as the children um, turn up, um, they start to challenge this idea that they are these apolitical, stricken waifs, the idea that children have totally no agency at all. Of course, they challenge that. A, a lot of them have had quite, um, uh, quite significant political experiences um, uh, you know, as part of their upbringing during the Spanish Second Republic. Um, there are controversies connected to the children, especially um, over the question of their repatriation. Uh, and it was impossible to sustain this initial broad based humanitarian enthusiasm for them. Um, as time goes on, the children were able to contribute a little to their own upkeep um, as, as funds tighten. Um, some of the children in, in some of the places they're sent to um, dress up in national costume. They make their own kind of costumes. They, they do songs and dances. Uh, to audiences across uh, the regions in which they're staying. And they, they, they prove quite lucrative. 
Um, so, so there is some sense of the children being able to contribute to their own upkeep, which gave them a, a degree of agency and uh, reduced their sense of helplessness. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire enslaved Frederick Douglass, risking his life for liberty, and about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today, and join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode, where I'd like to tell you a story. All you need is a few minutes to start your day off with something historic when you listen to the This Day in History podcast. Every day there's a new episode for you to listen and learn about what happened that day way back when. Today could be the day a famous mobster met their end, or the first milestone for humans in space. Who knows what history today holds? Find out when you listen and subscribe to This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. That's This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. So you mentioned that when they get to Britain, they end up in a field with tents, but yes. that's not how, <laughs> hopefully they were moved out of there as quickly as possible. So what was the, the, like, the living conditions for these children? I, I assume it, it varied a lot from place to place, but, but what, was it, what was life like in Britain for what turned into years? Yeah, absolutely. There, there would have been um, 4,000 totally different experiences. Um, and of course, many of those experiences have been lost. Um, thankfully, partly through the work of the Basque Children's Association um, that you mentioned at the beginning, we've been able to capture uh, more of these stories um, from the children in their in their older ages. But um, yeah, they were they were dispersed from uh, North Stoneham uh, between May and September 1937. They were they were sent to locations across the country. So some children ended up staying in that field for um, uh, from May through to September. Um, uh, you know, as I say, conditions at the beginning were pretty chaotic in the in North Stoneham. Um, things did did you know as 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 with anything, kind of um, the, the, the adults in charge started to learn uh, how to how to walk, how to do this. A lot of a lot of people, this was the first time anything like this had happened, um, or they've been involved in anything like this. So they had to kind of sometimes make it up as they went along. But order was gradually um, installed at North, at North Stoneham, um, but uh, they, they were quite eager to get the children out of there. Um, so they were they were dispersed to locations across the country. As I said, the Salvation Army took 400. The, the Catholic Church took 1,200. Most of the remainder went to what were called colonies, um, which was set up on the initiative of local individuals and groups. Um, so I live I live in a, a town called Ipswich. In Ipswich, a, a group uh, was formed uh, which took 100 children. Uh, 100 children came here uh, in June uh, 1937, uh, and these local groups uh, tended to take on. Uh, the burden of fundraising locally and, um, and and looking after the children locally, which took some pressure off the, the Basque Children's Committee. Um, we don't know exactly how many colonies existed. Um, that's still debated. Um, lots of uh, kind of local history groups uh, kind of do research into the Basque children and help us kind of get a sense of uh, the different places they went to. But approximately 70 to 90 colonies existed at various times and places across England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and uh, some were very short-lived, some lasted, uh, lasted for um, uh, a few years. Uh, children could and did move between colonies. So, so the, you know, they're quite impermanent, transient uh, places. Um, so, so, for example, children come, the children who come to Ipswich, they stay in uh, a Georgian mansion house for the first um, 
uh, for the first eight or nine months of their stay here. And then they moved to an old uh, disused workhouse um, 10 miles outside of Ipswich uh, for the, the next part of their stay. So, so the same colony uh, stays in different places and very different experiences from a, from a beautiful kind of mansion house to a rat infested uh, old workhouse. Um, but at least it was a, a roof over their heads. Um, so there, yeah, there was a huge variety of experiences. Um, I mentioned that the children um, got into controversy, and some of that was related to the the poor the, the poorer experiences that they had. So, so some groups which were sent to uh, Breckford in Wales or Harwood Dale near Scarborough, um, they had very poor accommodation, very poor food. Food was often kind of the, the crucial factor in whether a colony succeeded or not, um, and this caused some kind of uh, uh, local um, uh, unrest. Um, stories of Basque children roaming the local area with knives or throwing stones were reported in the in in the newspapers and led to led to scandal other other colonies were much happier um uh, the, the the colony at Ipswich was was like a boarding school for example so the children kind of had their rooms they had their lessons on on site uh, and the food was pretty good um i think um the adrian bell who i keep mentioning who's who's the kind of uh, the, the main historian of the children he called he called this a lottery of dispersal and some children were decidedly luckier than others. Um, so the children who went to Cambridge, for example, uh, were greeted by several hundred people welcoming them at the railway station, which is quite touching. Um, same with the children who came to Ipswich, they were greeted by a crowd at the railway station. But, you know, there were sometimes um, uh, more problematic uh, relationships with local communities. Um, in Margate, um, this is often kind of described as the uh, horror story of the um, of the colony experience. Um, Margate, which is a seaside town in Kent, uh, the children um, often went cold and hungry in a disused and dilapidated schoolhouse. Uh, there wasn't much order in the colony. The, the kind of uh, the people in charge didn't uh, implement um, much sense of purpose. There was a lot of bullying and not enough staff. So you, you know that was that was problematic, and uh, the BCC sometimes had to step in. Um, to deal with problems but at the same time the BCC couldn't afford to be choosy at times it had to it had to kind of take uh, what it could get uh, sometimes uh, particularly later on um, so so yeah there's 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 a um, there's a diverse experience there um, in East Anglia where I live as I said the Cambridge colony was very successful the Ipswich colony was very successful at least at first um, uh, just down the road from me, a place called Langham, which is between Ipswich and Colchester, there was a colony uh, in the countryside um, which was run by the Peace Pledge Union. They they agreed to take 60 children uh, into this country mansion at uh, Langham. Um, it was financed entirely by Peace Pledge Union members and uh, sim and, and its sympathisers making donations. Um, and uh, that colony was, uh, by all accounts, wonderful. The education was superb. The children um, wrote and published their own magazine of which copies survive so we get a sense of the children's uh, voice um i would i would say um beneath the kind of um camaraderie which was often engendered in the successful colonies um the children were off uh, you, you know they they, they they would they will often say in their memories that they had a happy time in particular colonies but even those who were happy of course they could never escape the memory uh, of what was going on in Spain. They often thought about their parents, you know, the era before, um, you know, we say in 2020 with, with families um, sometimes struggle to kind of keep in touch, but of course we've got things like Zoom and FaceTime, et cetera. You, you, you know, in 1937, uh, these children very rarely heard from their parents, if at all. Uh, and this was, this was a source of great concern. Uh, one child whose memories I have from uh, the Ipswich colony, she remembers being very happy uh, with, with, with life, um, uh, with life that life life in Suffolk in Ipswich, uh, but she does remember also crying herself to sleep sometimes because she thought about her parents. Um, so, so you know that was that was always there in the in the back of their minds. Um, as they lived in, in Britain for these years, months and then years, was there growing government pressure to start sending them back even before maybe the civil war was over? Yeah, abs absolutely. And this this was the major controversy the children got themselves into, um, which um, and, and again, things happen quite quickly um, because the turning point is the 19th of June, 1937. So, again, just going back through the dates, 26th of April, Guernica, 23rd of May, the children arrive in Britain, 19th of May, uh, Bilbao falls to the rebel forces. Um, this is announced at North Stoneham over uh, the loudspeakers there, and it causes 
uh, causes absolute mayhem. Um, the, the children burst into tears, they're, they're wailing. Some um, run into the woods and it takes, it takes a while to kind of gather them back. Some of the older boys march down to Southampton waterfront and say they're going to get on the boat, get on a boat and go and help their, help their fathers. Um, you, you know, this is, this, this, um, uh, this is a real kind of source of um, uh, sadness and anxiety for the children. Um, but of course, with, with victory over the Basque country, uh, with the fall of Bilbao, Franco um, and the Francoist authorities say the children come back now. Conditions permit their repatriation. The, the Basque country is not a war zone anymore. And so less than a month after the children arrive here, this question of repatriation fragments the broad-based humanitarian cooperation, which had up to this point marked the Basque Children's Committee. Franco finds support from Catholic opinion and right-wing opinion, opinion in Britain. Uh, but the Basque Children's Committee was caught in a dilemma because... Um, as, as time goes on, it wants to repatriate children, if possible, if safe, not least because uh, increasingly um, all these funds that are being raised for Spain in Britain, a lot of them are going to the Basque children um, because of their continued stay. And, and the um, National Joint Committee in particular is, is worried that it's not sending enough money to, for relief work in Spain itself. Um, but the Basque Children's Committee also feels a, a, a deep uh, and heartfelt responsibility um, for orphans, um, so children who have become orphaned or were orphaned, um, uh, the children of parents who have been imprisoned, so particularly left-wing parents, if, if their parents were in prison, they didn't want to send them back to uh, uncertainty. Um, and many parents have become refugees themselves um, during, uh, during the ongoing fighting in the Basque country and uh, had, had gone to France or elsewhere. So uh, the majority of the, the Basque Children Committee members wanted to obtain assurances uh, that the Basque country was no longer a dangerous war zone, but also more, more difficult in some ways to establish where the parents were and what they wanted, what the wishes of the parents were. Um, and this could be quite tricky because you'd think that a letter from a parent would uh, a letter from a parent saying, come back, everything's fine. You'd think that would be a clear piece of evidence saying, um, uh, yeah, it's fine to send these children back. Um, but the Basque Children's Committee reported a meeting, in, uh, the Basque Children's Committee met in July 1937 and one of the things they discussed was that one of the children at the Thaden Boy colony outside London had received a letter from their father um, but this letter had a small tear in the top left hand corner um, and that this was a prearranged signal that nothing in that letter should be trusted. And we see a lot of kind of uh, examples of this where the, the parents are given the children codes to say um, if the letter looks like this or has something about it or refers to a relative who's dead, but I'm talking about them as if they're alive, that this means do the opposite or do not trust this letter. So it becomes, it becomes, quite, it becomes quite tricky for the Basque Children's Committee to fulfill its duty of care uh, to these children and their parents' wishes. Um, but repatriation really begins in earnest in November 1937, although uh, by July 1938, around 2,000 of the children are still in Britain. Um, the historian Peter Anderson, um, who's, who's at Leeds, he's um, written on the repatriation controversy, a really interesting article uh, on repatriation, and he says it kind of emerges as a transnational battlefield of the Spanish Civil War. Um, uh, both in Spain and in Britain, you have uh, the children being used as propaganda symbols by both sides. Um, you, you know, those in those in Britain who wanted to, uh, Britain and Spain who wanted to kind of uh, protect the children. Um, you know, arguing that to send them back to fascism would be would be would be terrible for them. Whereas um, the the kind of uh, Francoist opinion being, you, you know, these children having their souls torn away from them by the leftists. You know, it becomes really. Uh, it becomes nothing less than a battle for these children's uh, souls. Um, so yeah, it's 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 quite controversial. Uh, in in my in my own research, um, uh, the, the the lady who runs the Ipswich colony is a lady called Chloe Volumey, who's who's a fa kind of fascinating individual. Um, uh, you know, she she had a lot of sympathy sympathy for the Spanish Republic, had been in Spain before the Civil War and spoke Spanish. Um, she resists attempts to send children back to what she called utter misery and starvation. She suggested to the Basque Children's Committee she'd be morally compelled to take whatever measures may be necessary to prevent the return of children from Ipswich unless she received adequate reassurances that, they, um, that they'd be safe. Um, the Basque Children's Committee write back to her and say, you have every right to protest, but if you 
try and keep children here against the, the Bass Children's Committee's will, um, you'll have to resign. Uh, you, you can't be in charge of these children. She didn't quit, but she, she made the point um, that as a local organiser, um, she was in a much better position than the authorities in London to select children to go back to Spain for repatriation because these local organisers were in direct daily contact uh, with the young refugees. They could obtain the latest information regarding their parents' situation. Just to give you an example, um, this is a letter that she, um, uh, this is from a letter she wrote in uh, March 1938 about um, seven of the children um, who had been earmarked for repatri repatriation. So she said, one of them, this girl's father has been a prisoner for some time. Uh, another, another, the mother is in Bilbao, but never speaks of the father. Another um, last letter from father received last June. Um, another, these children receive letters, but parents constantly urge them to stay in England as long as possible and not to go back to Bilbao. Another, father is believed to be a prisoner and another has had no letter since December. So she's writing about her knowledge of these seven children and, um, and what their parents want or whether their parents are, are even in contact or not. Uh, it's not clear if these complaints directly influenced the Bass Children's Committee, but out of these, um, uh, about of these, uh, seven out of these seven children, only two were repatriated immediately. Two went to Spain a year later. Another made the journey in 1940 and two stayed permanently in Britain. So, um, uh, you know, repatriation was a really emotive and very difficult question, both for uh, the Bass Children's Committee, the, the people who were looking after the children around the country, the children themselves, and of course their parents. You mentioned a lot of concerns about repatriation in, in bad circumstances. Do we know if any of those concerns proved to be accurate? Um, yeah, again, again, the experience of children who went back to Spain is varied. Um, and again, you could, you could uh, tell a different story uh, for every child who went back. Um, the Basque Children's Committee received reports of children who had been returned only to end up on the streets without their families. Um, many who recalled their experience later in life uh, recalled uh, that they'd returned to difficult or terrible times under the Franco dictatorship. Uh, one recalled as they, as they kind of went back into Spain, it was strange to suddenly hear Spanish spoken everywhere again. Uh, another said that everyone who stayed in Britain was better off than if they'd gone back to Spain. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the material that I've seen would su suggests that it wasn't it wasn't all it wasn't necessarily a great experience to go back to uh, um, back to the Basque country. Of course, it was immediately post fighting. Um, for many of them, it was quite traumatic to to go back to a dictatorship, um, especially if their parents had been uh, politically opposed to Franco. Uh, that made things uh, that could make things very difficult. Uh, parents who've been imprisoned or lost their jobs uh, as a result. Um, uh, but but in other in other kind of memories I've read, sometimes the children say they went back to Spain and you know you know it was hard, but life went on and you, you know they they were back with their families uh, and uh, had families of their own uh, as as they uh, as they entered adulthood. Um, and uh, it's worth pointing out that some who remained in the UK in their later life or um, went elsewhere often reflected um, that, that while they were happy in the UK and while they'd had happy lives in the UK, they wondered what life could have been like if they'd have stayed in Spain um, and often continued to miss their families. It was very difficult if they weren't repatriated. It was very difficult to uh, um, see their families again, um, especially, especially in, the media, um, in, in the immediate kind of uh, aftermath of the uh, Spanish Civil War. Often they wouldn't see their parents until the 50s or, or beyond. And, uh, and, and those trips are quite interesting to read reports of how, how um, threatened these, these children who had kind of grown up in Britain in the democracy felt when they went to Franco, Spain. So, so you mentioned that there were still children left when uh, an event occurs in 1939 um, that, that spools out yeah. into a war. Um, so how many children were actually not repatriated before the war started or were still in Britain maybe when the war ended? Yeah, there was, a, there, was, there was still a few hundred in Britain uh, when, the, um, when the Second World War broke out. Um, from um, late 1939 through until the fall of France in May 1940, uh, you'd still find groups of children um, assembling at Victoria Station in London, um, at this point clutching gas, mask, gas masks, which the uh, Bass Children's Committee had uh, given to them uh, for, their, for their return journey. So they're still, they're still kind of sent, sent back across um, to France and then on to Spain. 
up until up until May 1940. Um, but what to do with those who weren't repatriated? Well, um, and, and what happened to them? Uh, the Basque Children's Committee um, started to think about the older boys um, and what they would do. They were they were kind of coming of age. Um, in, in May 1939, um, they realised there were about 150 boys who were be aged between 14 or 18 who were unlikely to be repatriate, repatriated because of their parents' situations. Um, and so they kind of uh, cooperated with the trade union movement to establish the Basque Boys Training Committee. Um, and this was um, designed to provide these children with an agricultural or industrial education um, so that they could be able to kind of support themselves, whether they um, became... British citizens or whether they move, moved on. Um, and there were certainly openings for a lot of these boys during the, the Second World War, war effort. Um, a lot of older boys took jobs in things like engineering and agriculture and the building trade, uh, and some signed up to serve in the RAF, uh, the Navy or, or the Home Guard. Um, you know, that commitment to fight, fight fascism um, still burned quite strongly in those who, who hadn't returned. Um, there also remained a substantial number of younger children who were too young to work, um, who um, remained dependent on adult care and supervision. Um, by June 1941, the Basque Children's Committee still had responsibility for 148 children under 14. Uh, and so there's still a handful of colonies operating in the Second World War, um, although they really struggled for, for, for funds in, in, this, in this period. Um, so there were six colonies left in 1943 by 1943 and only two by 1944. Uh, the colony at Kosholten, um was the last one and survived post Second World War until it had finished looking after the last of the youngest children. Um, ultimately, around 250 of the 4000 never went back to uh, Franco Spain or at least settled permanently outside. Many of many of them stayed in Britain. Um, and as I said, some do make these poignant and dangerous uh, visits back to Spain under the, under the dictatorship, but they do um, uh, choose to make their lives elsewhere. Um, one of the best children I've been fortunate enough to meet, a man called Paco Robles, um, he's um, in his 90s now, uh, and he was one of the children who came to Ipswich. Um, and he came back to Ipswich a couple of years ago for the first time since the 1930s, because um, uh, a plaque was unveiled at the um, site where he, where he stayed. Um, and he's, re he's remarkable. His memories are, memories are very interesting. Um, but but um, he, he said, um, I don't feel Spanish in Spain. I feel like a foreigner. In England, too, I feel like a foreigner. As evacuees, we had our national identity taken away from us. It was stolen from us. So in a lot of the memories you see, you see similar reflections about, you know, gratitude um, gratitude for the sanctuary provided um, in 1937, but also this sense of, you know, you know, childhood being a very important formative experience and missing out on family, missing out on education, um, but also this kind of uh, broader sense of who are you, um, you, you, you know, in terms of national identity. Uh, so it's 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 quite it's quite interesting. Um, so, so can you talk about the Basque Children Association, which is uh, and what its kind of mission is and what it's doing to help educate people uh, about the experiences of these children? Uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, as, as you said, uh, it was set up in um, 2002. It was set up by um, people who were connected um, to, to the experience of 1937. Um, so Natalia Benjamin, who who um, who founded, uh, who, who was one of the co-founders of the, the association, she was the daughter of um, teachers of the children, um, both both a Spanish teacher, her mother, and, and an English teacher, her father. Um, and her father actually lived and worked in Ipswich. Uh, so so I, feel, I feel like I'm I, I'm living in this kind of centre of uh, of uh, kind of Basque children activity in some ways here here in uh, here in Suffolk. Um, so Natalia was very concerned that um as as the uh, children got older and uh, unfortunately of course as they as they reach old age and, and die their memory was being lost um and so together with uh manuel moreno who who is a son who was the son of who is the son of uh, one of the children um and uh they they um they set up this association to kind of preserve uh, collect and preserve materials and so the Basque children's association has itself built up quite a quite a large archive of um testimony uh, and other uh, materials relevant to the Basque children's story um, and the association in recent years has formed quite a good link with the University of Southampton archive 
uh, service uh, who hold the archive of the association as well as other materials connected to the uh, experience of the children. So it's quite nice that Southampton continues that connection with the children and the, the association is involved in various events uh, in Southampton. Um, so yeah, the primary material, the primary aim was to gather primary material before before it was lost. Uh, but over time, the association has developed into uh, it, well, it, it developed into a network for the surviving children and their families. So it so it holds kind of um, or, or at least used to hold um, reunions uh, for significant uh, anniversaries where the children could meet and um, you, you know talk about their experiences to to kind of a, um, different audiences. Um, it's increasingly uh, been involved in commemoration activity. Um, one of the things I, I mentioned that uh, we uh, had, we were involved in an event um, to put a blue plaque up, um, not an official blue plaque, but something that looks like a blue plaque um, on uh, the, the, the kind of Ipswich colony. Uh, in fact, we've, put, we've now put one up on both of the, the colonies that, that operated near Ipswich. Um, and throughout the country now, there are these plaques um, uh, commemorating uh, where the children stayed, which is which is quite nice because people can walk past what look like very ordinary buildings sometimes, and see you know something remarkable happened here. There's there's one um, uh, you know for example uh, every time I go to Cambridge, I go on the train, I get off the train, and I you know you only have to walk a few steps, and there's a building there where the children stayed, and there's a plaque uh, there's a plaque on it there. Um, so we do commemorative activity, we do educational work, so um, we talk to schools, local history groups, things like things like that. Uh, we run a, a, a very, um, well, increasingly a populated website, a website full of information, um, which can help to spark uh, further research, hopefully. We, we hope people will look at it and think, kind of, well, can I, can I look into my local area more and contribute to, to this history? Um, the website's well worth visiting, uh, that's baskchildren.org. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter as well. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't, of course, had many events this year, um, but, um, but hopefully when, when things return to normal, we'll be uh, kind of uh, doing things all over the country again. We um, increasingly have links with the Basque country itself. Um, we have a sister organisation now, um, the Basque Children Association, Buscardi, um, which, uh, you know, spreads our, spreads our work uh, in, in the Basque country. And there's a lot of interest in, in, in the history of the Basque children uh, there too. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do a great deal. I've probably forgotten something and I'll probably be told off by the other trustees uh, for forgetting these things. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's really good fun. And I, I think the, um, it's, it's, um, it's a really important history. It's, it's, one that, it's one of those histories where when you, when you kind of uh, first say it to an audience uh, of people, often people say, I never knew about that. They might know something about the kinder transport, but the Basque children kind of, because I guess it was the beginning of this, uh, extremely busy period of history and a, a busy period of history for child uh, evacuees as well because the Basque children are followed by the kinder transport they're followed by wartime evacuees as well um, th th their history can become a little buried under under all of this um, so it's, it's one of those kind of histories that's really nice to talk to people about because it's something often that's quite new to them um, and uh, and it's one that's still really relevant today I mean uh, the, the question of child refugees hasn't gone away um, in Britain or anywhere else so um, uh, you know, it's 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 got it's got lessons both good and bad. I think um, for for people to kind of draw upon this this history. Thank you for joining me here for this conversation uh, about this topic. I I also I will admit I knew nothing about this before uh, reaching out to you uh, two months ago, I think, or a month and a half ago. So thank you. Uh, no, no problem at all. Uh, thank you.